Welcome to the Growing Up Bananas podcast, where we dissect the perks and tribulations of being bananas. It's hard being yellow when I feel so white. My name is Ethan. Kevin's sitting next to me, and in many ways I sit next to him. What do you have in store for us? Today we're discussing some of our most successful bargain hunting stories. Later on, we are joined by Keith, who is going to share his amazing journey so far. Keith is a professional badminton player and an overall great guy. Let's get into it. So when it comes to bargain hunting, we look no further than some of our, I guess, most successful stories. Um, I think any Asian, they enjoy a bargain or, or free freebies, to be honest. So Yeah, can't go wrong with their freebie. Things like cashback, shopbacks. Um, birthdays. Yeah, birthdays. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. like a whole story in itself. That feeds. That basically feeds you for two days if you do it right. Yeah. So all of those, let's talk about uh, a few of those ones. So the one that comes to mind was basically how we had free Froyo for, let's call it a couple of weeks. <laughs> sure. Can, can you remember how that sort of panned out or how that adventured? Um, so one of our favorite shopping centers, we won't name names, no. um, was they started promoting this new QR code where you, anytime you visit any restaurant, you could scan the QR code and you'd get like 10 points. So for the first few days, we're like, oh, this is great. You know, walking around cause we used to hang out there all the time. So we just yep. go around, buy some bubble tea. Buy e- some each visit was meant to be one scan. Exactly. And, um, yeah, we just scanned it. And after a while, I noticed that none of the shops actually put the QR code poster away. So we ended up just taking photos of it. And from home, you just scan every single one every day. So we're racking up, I think, at least 100 points plus a day. Yeah. And we ended up making like a little Google Drive folder for our friends to scan as well. And one Froyo from memory was... 60 points i think something like that something like you that could, you could make more than one a day yeah from so scans. every time we visited this unnamed shopping center we were getting a nice free taro soft serve which were great they were amazing so we looked into the program as well and their top valued um i don't know prize as you would call it or value yeah. item was flight center vouchers so that was our goal and i think it was like like 25,000 points or something. <laughs> we worked it out. We were going to able to get basically flights for four of us Yeah. to Bali. I think that's where we wanted to go at the yeah, time. That's it. Um, it would have taken us three months I think it, yeah, of I daily scanning. Months. Yep. <laughs> so <laughs> that began the long trek. <laughs> um, I think after a few weeks, um, something happened. Like this system must have picked up that we were scanning things from home or maybe the GPS you know, picked us up that we weren't actually in the shopping center. So over the weeks, they started making changes. It was almost like cat and mouse. You know, they were telling the restaurants <laughs> to put the poster away. Um, every, and then eventually, you know, some of them got lazy. So um, every week they actually printed new QR codes because we noticed they were scanning it and they were like invalid. Yep. So Which obviously again flagged the system. Flagging the system. So it was a lot of cat and mouse, you know, for the first few weeks. But we are just... Basically, we weren't able to get the flight center vouchers, unfortunately, because uh, they caught on to us. But the free froyos were still worth it. Yeah, it's free froyo almost, you know, two three times a week for um, not a lot of effort. So <laughs> probably one of our guests, I'd, I'd say, are probably one of our most um, successful expeditions. Yeah. But we've got so many friends who you know absolutely love a bargain. They're hunting Oz bargain daily. Um, Barbara, a friend of the show. Yeah. If you're looking for a deal, um, suss her out. Um, we've got the KFC uh, exploitation, I guess. If you could touch on that. Do you remember how she basically gave everyone free buckets? Uh, so that one was an app. And I remember it being around Easter time where you were supposed to go to different locations That's around right. Brisbane to basically pick up the bucket. You know, virtually you'd use the VR. It was like a virtual reality thing and you actually look for it where you're in Westfield or whatever suburb and you scanned it and you get to like roll a dice or something. And That's right. Yeah. It's a random thing. So it's either like an instant win or you win. Or you go into a draw or something. So the best prize was like basically a whole bucket of chicken and she racked up a ton of those. Yeah. By, I guess, manipulating the GPS on her phone. Yeah. Yeah. She was using some GPS spoof at a put herself in places that she wasn't 
I think she also benefited pretty well from the Pokemon Go, um, using it again to walk fake miles. Um, <laughs> basically, any system that is there to be exploited, um, an Asian will find a way. So unfortunately for the rest of the people who are doing the right thing, um, it doesn't go for very long. Uh, good times. Um, I think another one just off the top of my head is um, you basically where you you can get a, a you can get a gift card on sale, then you use that gift card at a time where let's say a shop's offering you know fifty percent off as well. So you're using double double discounts and it kind of just compounds itself, and you end up paying nothing for something pretty good. I think Time Zone has something similar now. Oh, yeah, we can buy gift cards on sale and have double day, and then. You still have to do the, you still have to play the games, but the amount of points you can rack up is just ridiculous. Nice, nice. I think I remember too. Um, similar to the KFC one, it was the Baskin Robbins one. Do you remember that? Uh, ben and Jerry's. Ben, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah. Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, that was around Easter too, from memory, because we were eating ice cream and chicken around the same time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that one again was, I think Osbargan put it up. And it was like, Outfitting. if you create a new account, you get a free tub of Ben and Jerry's. Ben and, Jerry's yeah. and someone somewhere who we're not connected with figured out that you didn't actually have to have a unique, um, I guess, new new account every time. So all they did was just kept creating or kept signing up for accounts, and it was a free a free tub of Ben and Jerry's every time. And like I'm pretty there. sure we still have nine or ten tubs in our freezer. <laughs> So pretty much, I guess, moral of the story is you can't leave any hole in these sorts of promotions when Asians are involved. Can't leave any hole unfilled. That's also a motto of our lives. So we've got Keith coming on later. Kev, um, I guess before we get him on, what have you been up to since we last spoke with you? Um, I guess the most recent thing was last night. We, uh, me and Marissa did our, group, our first poll competition together. Um, Queensland Pole Championship nice. and came first runner up, which was amazing. I'm still living on that high, actually. My first first comp, um, getting on the podium is bloody good. Yeah, can't complain with that. How many how many groups were there? Uh, I think there was six. That six groups. Nice. There was like twenty amateurs and then professional. I think had like six or seven. Oh, so it's different. As well, like different yeah, categories. three different categories. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It was amazing to watch. Just so much talent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm still living the high. Still got to do my thank you post everyone as well, actually. Thanks for reminding me. Well done, man. And how long you said you sort of prepped for over a year to, to get to that? Yeah, well, me and Marissa have actually been training now for a year and a half in total. I've been doing pole for about a year and a half. Yep. Um, this routine that we put together was done in probably five to six weeks from start right. to finish. Like, we didn't really get the drill down heavily into it until last month, like all of August... Because she was doing Miss Pole. She was prepping for that. And it was only after she finished that we had like a solid three weeks to really drill this routine down. So I'm pretty happy with the result and the work we've done in that time. Yeah, it was a very big shift because obviously I do like Cali and then pole training and still a bit of gym work. All of that just went on hold and it's just purely routine stuff and making sure I didn't get injured. And that was probably the hardest part. Just, yeah, just, just making sure I didn't do dumb shit for the next <laughs> four weeks. Well, we're leading up to something like that. It's the last thing like, you don't think about it, but I guess it's the same for any athlete. You want to really peak, but also be in at yeah, least the healthiest it. you are yeah. going into that. I keep reading about that. Like, you, There's a way you train where as you build up for the comp date, you can probably relate. You know, you have to be in this peak um, peak of your performance yeah. where you're well rested, but you've had the adequate training. Yeah. I guess, so, yeah, you imagine like the 100 meter sprint, you're running literally for not even sometimes less than 10 seconds yeah. for four years of training and not being injured, but also being at the peak during that, that that'd be the hardest thing to try and manage. Mm. And then what's next? So you got the little bit of taste of um, some success. What's, what's next then? Um, eyes, my eyes now on Mr. Pole Dance uh, next year, which I think is in Sydney. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled for that one. That's yeah. what I'll be training for now and really focusing on that. And also, if you wanted any sort of tips or, or training from Kev, I'm sure he'd be open to helping anyone out who's looking for some guidance. Yep. Yeah, just, you know where to find me. That's it. On Instagram. Let's, uh, let's get Keith on. Sweet. Let's do it. So it's a, it's a big honor for us today to have Keith join us. Uh, Keith is a professional badminton player, 
um, a man of style, as you can see, probably hit with the ladies. And um, basically, yeah, we just want to get a bit of an idea of uh, what life's like for you. How are you today, man? Yep, I'm good, thanks. How are you guys? Yeah, really well. Pretty good. Really thanks. well. So, man, um, let's start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, let's take us back to your childhood, your upbringing. So, you're from Malaysia. Let's, um, yeah, what was, what was life like for you growing up? Um, so I guess growing up in Malaysia, um, I come from a mixed background. So my dad's actually Indian and my mom's Chinese, so I'm half and half. So um, I guess a lot of mix of cultures, like a lot of Indian culture, Chinese culture. And I guess Malaysia being like very multicultural in general. So there's a lot of mix. So like all my friends and people I grew up with were just like literally everyone, like Indians, Chinese, Malay. So I, I guess everyone kind of got along. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it, yeah. That's right. So um, siblings? Yeah, so I have uh, one older brother. He's um, 13 months older than me. Oh, right. That's, yeah. that's a miraculous then, uh, baby. <laughs> I, had, uh, I have a younger sister and she is, I think she's 15 this year. Okay. So that's a big gap. Um, yeah, big gap. Yeah, so I guess me and my brother growing up, we shared a lot of friends and probably did a lot of stuff together in Malaysia as well as uh, Australia growing up, yeah. And did you grow up in a in a big city in Malaysia? Yes, yeah, so I actually grew up in uh, Kuala Lumpur, so the bigger city, the main city, I guess. Um, so very busy, lots of stuff happening. Um, yeah, very happening city, I guess, just in general. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so, so Kevin's background for the audience, he, he's Malaysian Chinese. Yeah, Chinese Malaysian as well. Parents also from KL. Okay. Yeah. So, so you probably spend a bit of time there when you go on holidays and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, used to, especially when I was younger. Um, last time I've been there now is probably a few years ago now. Would like to go back. Yeah. Let's see, maybe at the end of the year. I've been, I've been probably four or five times, but it's usually on transit to, you know, if you go to Europe or yeah. South Africa visiting family. And yeah. I've loved it. Yeah. I love KL, but that's just you know, a day or two stopover. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love the food there. Yeah, so. yeah. Everyone says that the food are always... <laughs> so food. affordable. Yeah. hate the weather there. <laughs> <laughs> well, how it rains quite a lot, doesn't it? Um, I think you probably have, like, a couple of months where it's, like, raining season. Yeah. But other than that, it's quite hot and sunny. Yeah. But really, really hot. <laughs> and then growing up, so mum and dad, um, were they... Sort of, were they professionals? Um, what sort of work did they do? Yeah, so both my parents, they actually uh, work in uh, in the pharmaceutical line. So they do pharmaceutical sales. Um, my dad actually worked for Pfizer in Malaysia. Oh, right. Okay. And my mom worked for an Australian company called Inova. Yeah, so they just did that for ever since I can remember. And yeah. I think, yeah, my dad also had a few businesses on the side. Like, uh, Is that how they met? No, no, no. My, my parents actually, um, they met each other when I think my dad was 15. My mom was probably 13. All oh, right. Like yeah, wow. so they came from a really small town. Not sure if you heard of it. Um, Kuala Lipis, I think it's in... Uh, I haven't. That's yeah, it's somewhere near Pahang. Yeah, so like a different state, really, really, really small town where everyone kind of knows each other. Yep. Yeah, so I think they their, their families were, were living there. That's how they met in, uh, in church and in high school. They went, went to the same school. Oh, cool. Yeah. And in terms of their, um, I suppose, their parenting, were they quite strict growing up or did they just kind of let you guys do what, yeah. whatever you needed you to? You mentioned church as well. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say, yeah, they were strict but not like typical Asian parent strict. Yeah, I think they were quite, um, they were quite open to a lot of things as well, within reason, of course. Yeah. Is that quite rare in Malaysia? To have that sort of parenting? Um, yes and no. I would say like it's more common if you're from like a, from like a Catholic background where you're like more English speaking. So like at home we all speak English. Yep. Yeah. So we're not super super traditional. So I guess like there's a there's a lot of families like that. Yeah. So I guess it's more common for for families like that. Whereas like the more traditional ones, I guess maybe they're a bit more closed off. Maybe. So, it's, so what I'm hearing here is so it's more of like a religious um, sort of upbringing than I guess a more like Asian traditional. Yeah, I guess a bit a, a mix of both. It's just like may, maybe if you're like uh, there's a big majority of Muslims in Malaysia. Yeah. Like for example, if you're from a Muslim family, I guess you, their parents would probably be a lot more strict with like what they can and can't do and 
the way they dress maybe sometimes but for us it was more like yeah you can wear whatever you want or yeah sorry maybe i missed it what religion was it muslims oh muslim okay. yeah so you, your parents no no, no, so no. Kate's, Kate's catholic oh uh, yeah yeah, that's what I was wondering. yeah yeah okay. so yeah yeah cool man um and so kev can probably talk on this as well because he's he's off malaysian ancestry Mm-hmm. I know that there's quite a lot of a divide between the Malays, the Chinese, and then the Indians. Yep. Did you experience much of that um, sort of segregation or division mm-hmm. growing up? I guess I guess everyone probably experience it, experiences it at least once or twice growing up. But um, maybe as like kids, you don't really think of it too much, yep. especially when you're really, really young. Um so everyone kind of gets along, but then occasionally you have like uh, they would, might say something that's a bit offensive, like "Oh, you, he he's uh, he's Catholic," or you know, like when they bring up the religion thing, then it might be a bit weird. Like I remember I had this neighbor, like um, she the neighbor they had a daughter like same age as my sister, so they used to play with each other like yeah. every day, but then after like a couple of times. Um, I think the parents told their daughter to not play with my sister anymore because Jeez. yeah because she's Catholic or something like that. And then how we found out was that because the girl's so young she's innocent so she just said oh you're you're Christian I can't play with you. Something like that. So that's how we kind of found out. Yeah. <clears throat> Some stuff like that's that. crazy because it's yeah. totally something foreign to us. I mean yeah. here religion is I mean, we spoke about it off camera before. It's not as I said prevalent. Yeah. Um, in Australian society, so it's not rooted as heavily, I think, in even in government. Like my, I remember my dad telling me stories of how, like, ah, oh, what was it? In business, certain businesses, you need to have um, higher a quota, Malays, a quota of Malays. Yeah, yeah and then universities, yeah. they would um have like some Chinese and Malaysians. I don't know how they set it up in classes or they t- have a certain amount of intake. Yeah, Chinese. so I guess like that that's the part where I was saying like when you actually grow up, like once you get older and stuff like that, like uni, like you just kind of see like, oh, we don't have as much opportunity as like maybe Malays or... I mean, I guess the easiest way to put it is like Malays, they, they benefit because um, of the religion thing because yeah. it's a Muslim country. And I guess the the Chinese they do quite all right because of uh, they're quite well off majority they're quite well off in Malaysia yeah like uh, their parents really set them up well send them overseas to study they come back they're quite successful and then you have the Indians who are kind of stuck in the middle sometimes where yeah so are they are they kind of perceived as I would say the bottom because I don't want to look at it like that but they're the less fortunate. Yeah, in, in but I guess society. like for all all three races, they are the less fortunate. But I would say uh, the Indians kind of uh, get left out of a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, because of that. So Kev, your your you got family back in Malaysia. Have you heard anything in regards to that sort of division? Um, whenever they tell me about it, it's always just from the early days. I honestly don't know what it's like now. I haven't really been keeping up with the politics there. Um, might have to hit them up, but I haven't. Maybe it's better. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it probably, like you said, it goes to when you sort of at that age when it's uni and, you know, starting your career and things like that, the opportunities maybe aren't the same across the races, which is... Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I guess opportunity-wise. And another example is like, just say if you're buying a house, yeah. um, they have so like they have some land reserved for like uh, the Malay oh, people right. where they get it for really, really cheap. Yeah. Like it's a different price for wow for okay. different races or something like that yeah so before we move on to i guess why your family moved um to australia was sport something that you kind of used as your sort of i don't want to say outlet but i guess let's talk about that a little bit so when did you start playing badminton so i started playing badminton when i was probably six but then i started training when i was eight right that's young yeah and so you're stuck stuck at it as well yeah, so I actually used to play soccer as well yep. and badminton. Um, but when I got to, I think, 13 years old, that's when I picked badminton to, to really focus on that and uh, pursue that instead of soccer. Um, I guess as a kid growing up, I was quite active with sports. Yep. And I, I enjoyed playing a lot of sports. So I even did like uh, athletics. 
I actually played hockey a, a bit. <laughs> I played a little bit of hockey. hockey tournament. <laughs> Why badminton over soccer? Um, what drew you to it? Yeah, because I guess in Malaysia, like the biggest sport you could say is badminton. Mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, I looked at it from a perspective like, just say if I did pursue soccer, like how far can I actually go ah. if I if I do play for Malaysia? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So the career path yeah. or the opportunities. And I, and I thought like, oh, so like if I do play badminton, like if I do make it, then you know, I'm actually someone important in Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. point. And when did you realize that you were actually good? Or, um, or I guess that you could make something of it? Well, I mean, I guess I always had it in the back of my mind that I want to be good. But I'd say like maybe when I was in Malaysia, I wasn't like the best or anything like that. It was just, um, I just played and then I was, I was quite good at it, but not like insanely good at that time. Because maybe I didn't really... Um, didn't focus as much because I was doing soccer, I was doing running, I was doing a lot of things. Um, I guess it's only when I came to Australia where like I literally had nothing else to do. <laughs> then, yeah, then I just, without realizing, I guess I just started focusing a lot more on it. Yeah, amazing yeah. what happens when you focus on one or two things, yeah. not spread yourself too thin. Well, that's it. I mean, most, most kids are naturally gifted at something, but then they hop between cricket, and I'm talking about Australia, cricket, yeah. rugby, then they'll do with athletics, they'll play... AFL or something and then yeah. all of that what and is the 20,000 20, hour rule 10,000 I think 10,000 10, hours. 10, hours yeah but that's so true because a lot of those sports don't have that much crossover like no. the training is quite different and the body type that you build from pursuing yeah. say rugby compared to cricket is quite different as well yeah but yeah I mean, we'll do we'll definitely keep talking about the badminton stuff I just wanted to I guess get an idea of what it was like and then um, I guess we're fast forwarding through school a little bit mm-hmm. when um when did you guys come to Australia? How old were you? So when I came, I think I was, um, I was turning 14. Right. Yes, I was turning 14. So in Malaysia, I was in like my second year of high school. But when I came to Australia, um, I just started from the first year of high school again, year eight in Adelaide. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, nice. Did when did you get your first sponsor? Uh, first one was uh actually a really small brand so i got it when i was maybe like 16 yeah oh. 15, yeah 16 i think did you handle that yourself or did your parents sort of no, um you it? so what it what happened was i was training in adelaide and uh, one of these coaches who actually like kind of run the the training in adelaide he has a sport shop so um he he, he made a deal with this brand called ashaway for me so they they're based in singapore yeah. And I think he has a good relationship with them. So I think he spoke to them and said like, oh, if they're willing to sponsor me. And yeah, so I guess they were willing to, to support me for a few years. Yeah. It was it around that point where you started realizing that I can actually, you know, I can get by by just playing badminton and, you know, coaching and things like that? Mm, not really, actually. So I guess the, the only reason why I started kind of really, really pursuing it was... Um, when I did come to Australia, obviously, like, I would say the level between Malaysia and Australia is very far. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, so Malaysia, obviously, a lot better at the moment. Um, so when I did move to Adelaide, I I think, I guess, I, I started winning a lot. And then I, was, I, 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 was, I started to think, like, maybe could I start playing, like, for the national team or could I start playing international tournaments and stuff like that. And that, that kind of motivated me to to start training harder and then I guess when I was 16 I actually won under 19 nationals oh, nice. for Australia um, and I guess uh, that was something that maybe put me on track to kind of pursue it even more yeah taking a step back so when you came you're 13 14 and like you say the the standards way higher in yeah. Malaysia when you came over here you must have been the guy uh, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say the guy, but I guess when I came to Adelaide, um, everyone was like, oh, he's really young, but he's really good. Yeah. Something like that. So um, I guess that that was a, was a good thing because um, like outside of the badminton court, I was kind of like not, not really known anywhere. Yeah. So it was just like very comfortable going to the badminton court. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever feel like the confidence that you gained from badminton never helped in your own social life or outside of badminton or sport did it help you yeah definitely so i guess i'm quite lucky that i actually got 
to play badminton because like getting a chance to travel, getting a chance to meet different people as well. And also, I guess like all the qualities you need to be an athlete, it kind of shapes you into like the person like you are. And um, I guess it, it also like pushed me out of my comfort zone a lot because like actually growing up, I was very, very shy um didn't didn't talk much like, i wouldn't even say hi to anyone or just look at the ground yep yep i, I guess because that. of uh bampton still do yeah <laughs> i mean I, I occasionally still do as well yeah, yeah yeah but i guess bampton really like pushed me to because i have to do it like i have to go and talk to the coaches or i yep, might yep. have to talk to sponsors or You're traveling a lot like yeah, you said traveling or like even going to the airport and talking to the person at the counter or asking for help asking yep. for directions even that was a struggle for me yeah, I was wondering earlier with how you dealt with sponsors because like, I know you know, the business side of it can be difficult. How do you value yourself and things like that? So I was wondering if you yeah. did any of that yourself or if your coaches or your mentors helped you with that. Yeah, so um, I guess for for like equipment sponsors, like I did get some help from like coaches or, or people within Bampton. But like financially... I guess no one's really going to help you out much financially in terms of like travel or accommodation when you go for tournaments and stuff. Um, so when I was younger, I guess my parents did support me a lot growing up. Um, but I guess now, like, as I got older, I have to like kind of support myself a bit more. Like, and I do that by coaching. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, you're coaching. Yeah, cool. so I coach about 15 to 20 hours a week. Oh, right. Oh, Jeez. Awesome. That's, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. Decent. More than a, more than a part time job in itself because it's yeah. it's not just that it's you got to think about the session and yeah and planning. individualizing the, you know and all yeah so that that that's my main source of income at the moment and um, yeah I guess like over the years I've had like maybe four five brands sponsor me and also I guess I'm lucky enough now to be sponsored by a physio clinic actually oh, oh nice wow. yeah. that's great that's like free a, physio yeah, yeah free <laughs> physio free definitely would go astray <laughs> yeah and uh, all the injuries we get yeah that's good because like I used to avoid going for physio because it might be a bit expensive so yeah expensive. For sure yeah, yeah that's so true yeah so speaking of physio have you or injuries have you actually had any major injuries or setbacks um I would say not not many major injuries but like occasionally like a few overuse injuries here and there okay. and i guess the worst one i had was probably like uh i tore my groin slightly oh yeah and uh other what was the that, what was the time off the court on that one a couple of months yeah i guess i still kind of played it was on and off that's why i have really bad hips now oh, <laughs> yeah no. yeah because i didn't manage it well i just kind of continued playing and other than that i guess just i don't know i've rolled my ankles 15 times each maybe <laughs> Okay. And to get to that level, man, I mean, so like we said, I spoke to you a little bit before. I was I played a bit of hockey myself. So we had a very strong support system growing up, mm-hmm. a lot of good coaching. Um, how How is it for you? Because now, you know, you see you have these injuries, you overcompensated with your groin and your hips are kind of sore now. Have you had a lot of support from the, you know, the movement side and, and all that in, in badminton? Um. Do you mean like support in terms of... Oh, like, I guess good coaching. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so like a bit weird actually. So like when I first came to Australia, like there was this one coach in Adelaide and that was about it. So because Bampton's not really the biggest sport in Australia, there's not much support behind it or yeah, not much focus behind it. So um, I guess for many years of me being in, in, in Australia, like I actually had to train myself, organize my own training, um, just find my own training partners and some days just train by myself, whether it's just running or doing like some footwork on the court. So, so like I'm, strength and conditioning, you haven't really yeah. had anyone who's uh, helped not, you on that? Not specifically, but I guess now the physio that, I, that I'm sponsored by, he does help me with that. So he takes me to the gym and gives me like oh, a, a program and stuff. So I guess like that's probably the, the first proper one that I, I've got. And yeah, and and in badminton, where is I guess where is the money? Because you you look at um, I don't know if you watch cricket or mm-hmm. um, soccer. You probably probably follow soccer, but it's all in club. Yeah. So club, and then it's getting to now a point where internationals are kind of just on the side. Yep. So for me, I don't know much about the layout of the badminton. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you know federations and how all that works. So is it 
is the pinnacle to get to play for a national team and then hopefully get sponsors or are they like private um private leagues and things like that along yeah. the way um so like most national teams like if you do make a national team you usually get a salary okay. everything's taken care of but that's not really the case for like australia yeah yeah so you still i i'm part of the national team now but i still have to kind of support myself but the only way i guess you can kind of make money is by playing some leagues overseas so like there's a league in india yeah malaysia, so there's private leagues yeah yeah malaysia has some europe has a few and the other way is probably just playing tournaments yeah and coaching play, like, yeah coaching yeah. like uh international tournaments if you're playing like the really really big ones or the highest level ones if you win you might get like i don't know seventy thousand dollars us dollars but to win one of those is it's not yeah you're gonna be one of the, yeah. the best in the world yeah so yes yeah. fair enough yeah not as big as tennis <laughs> well yeah that's the thing i mean even you look at a, a professional swimmer yeah all their money's coming from endorsements yeah. Um, and then now they've started to set up, I don't know if you've seen this, Kev, they've set up these like private swimming competitions oh, yeah. where they draft various swimmers from around the world and then they just swim for like points. Oh. And that's now a new, um, I guess it's like the IPL for cricket where international, uh, I guess, boundaries and teams is just gone. So that's where all the money's at now in swimming. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Cool, man. Cool. Well, Let's go back then to the time in Australia. So you said you came around 13, 14. Yep. It's a tough time whether you moved, you know, yeah. schools just within Malaysia, but to come to Australia, you know, different accent. Fortunately, you spoke English. Yep. Um, let's talk a little bit about that the first couple of years. So um, what did you do? You, you were in Adelaide. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so when I first came, didn't really know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought like I'll be all right because I could speak English. Yeah, yeah, so when I did come, uh, I guess I remember my first day of school was uh, was not great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what so sort of school did you go to? I went to, it, it was more of a sports school kind of thing, but it was majority um, Australian people and the number of Asians or other <clears throat> other cultures in there were like not, not really that many. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. I mean, coming from an Asian background, I don't know if you guys experienced it where, like, my mom bought my school uniform that's going to, like, last me three years, four years. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, man, we I all definitely experienced that. I had two that. older brothers, so that was me. <laughs> yeah. for so, a long I time. guess, like, I went first day of school, oh, man. really big uniform, big <laughs> yeah, baggy same. pants. Massive yeah. backpack. Massive backpack yeah. and, like, all the yeah. weird stuff on me. And they keep Because I, I, I didn't even it. know, like, what, yeah, what, what to dress like. Yep. Yeah, so that was probably like a big shock. So I went there and I saw like everyone was just in shorts. And that's really weird to me because like in Malaysia, we all use long pants to school. Yeah. Even if it's really hot, like just long pants. Is it for sun safety? Or it's just... No, no it's, it's, just, it's just, just culture. Yeah, 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 cover the skin. Yeah. yeah. Can't show you new caps. Ah, oh, damn. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, right. And then like I saw everyone was using like... Um, it, the rule was like black leather shoes. So like everyone was using Vans, Converse... But yeah. I was using like actual dress shoes. Yeah. So that was all. Everyone like used to make fun of my shoes as well. Oh man. Yeah. Jeez. So I guess it was quite tough. And then, um, yeah, I guess I, I didn't really have any friends in school for, for a long time. And even after once I finished high school, I wouldn't say um, I really keep in touch with anyone. It was just like kind of a phase of my life where I went, went to school. Yeah. I just saw them in school. Yep. And after, there's just no contact after school or even during school, like m- just minimal. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, that, that was a bit difficult. And also adjusting to how, um, how, how they learn in Australia. Like, because I, I remember like my first day, that's when I got my laptop. So like in Malaysia, we don't use laptops or anything like that. So learning like. Jeez, it must have been a massive cultural shock. Yeah, I was. I was there's so many shock. things there. It's, you know, obviously just. Being in high school, yeah. it's tough. You got yeah. the race stuff, the culture, the yeah. everything. It's yeah, and then the food like, as well. I'm sure was yeah, like, yeah. way food, different. Food was different, and um, I guess something really weird was that um, everyone was really shocked that I could speak English. <laughs> yeah, and yep. I I think like a lot of people in Adelaide, not not too sure like if they've been overseas much or anything like that. Some even asked me like, does it snow in Malaysia? <laughs> yeah, so yep. I think they just had no idea like where it was um did you tell them it did 
<laughs> just to pull their legs. <laughs> I didn't, but they're going December. Yeah, forty-five, percent humidity. Yeah, so I guess was was very difficult high school, I would say. And how did you kind of cope with it? So for me, like I moved, we moved to Australia when I was twelve, mm-hmm. so similar age. Fortunately, I had two older brothers. My saving grace was sport. Mm-hmm. So every time I'd go to a new school or meet new people, I would have I was a half decent athlete, um, you know, cricket, hockey, things like that. That was my saving grace mm-hmm. was I could always go to the team, you know, hang out with the team and that would be my friends. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, your badminton is an individual sport. Did you have any anything that you could kind of rely on? Yeah, so for me, I guess it was the same. It was sports as well. But I wouldn't say like, the sports helped me in school. Yeah. It helped me like outside of school. So that like, that's why I said like, um, I, after school hours, I just have no contact with anyone from school. Yeah. So it's just like, I go to school and after school, like then I look forward to going for training. And, uh, that's why I see like most of my friends. Yeah. Yeah. But even then it took me quite a while to make like good friends in badminton because I was very shy and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I guess it, the sports did help a lot, but not really in school. And um, I, I think I just kept myself busy or kept myself occupied in school by just thinking about sports. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I you guess... You know, you just got to get through the day because you got practice later or something. Yeah, and that's yeah, kind of yeah. just... Or, like, sometimes before school, I used to, like, do some training before school, like, running and stuff. And, uh, yeah... Actually, like, during lunchtime, I used to maybe do, like, some exercise as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just find some empty space where no one's there and I might do some... some was that, stuff. was that like, did other people see it and wonder, like, why is no, this no, guy no, so no. weird? I guess no, no one saw it. I wouldn't want anyone to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's another thing, you know, they like, yeah. cross. Yeah, so... Oh, I, I used to, like, just maybe watch badminton matches on, on my laptop yeah. and just, like, keep thinking about it because, like, I didn't really want to be involved in school <laughs> yeah yeah so kev and i both had very similar experience um kev i guess before he moved to brisbane but me my whole schooling life just being a being a minority um and yeah probably similar to you just not quite fitting in somewhere mm-hmm. yeah i yeah. grew up in canberra similar story to you um all boys school i was probably the only no there was one other asian uh, i remember his name edwin and yeah, very similar story to yourself. It was oh, had a few friends, uh, a few best friends. Saw them outside of school because I used to do skateboarding as well, and I hung out with them after school. Um, used to play soccer, basketball a lot, so I had the team there. Um, but yeah, once I moved from Canberra to Brisbane, like lost contact with all of them to be honest, and just yeah. sort of started fresh here in Brisbane, which is great. I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, I sort of felt. In school, it was quite alienating, I think, just being, like, being the minority. Yeah. So, it was a rough sort of growing up, but I think it shaped me into the person I am today, those hardships. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, if you can try to get, get some sort of positive out of it. Yeah. Yep. Um, At the end of the day, I'm like, I always think, you know, if I give my could give myself or my younger self some advice, um, I know, you just kind of... Because right now, like, if I experienced that, I wouldn't care. It's just like... Water off you're you're a man now. You've got the confidence, yeah. all those things. But at the time, you just at the time you don't, you don't know the experience anything. or the yeah. knowledge. You know, is there anything you you can think about now, like saying, telling your younger self, and just specifically about school, mm-hmm. how you try to maybe deal with it? I don't want to say better, but how you might have dealt with it. Yeah. Um. I mean, I guess I would probably tell myself to try and be more confident. Yep. Like, just not really care too much. I think I was very conscious of... Uh, may- maybe people didn't really, like, care what I was doing, like, or if I dressed funny or whatever, not. Yeah. So I guess, like, I probably would have told myself to just not care so much and just do whatever, like... Probably would have saved me a lot of trouble because I, I, I think probably caused a lot of uh, unnecessary stress or anxiety when going to school thinking like oh what are people going to think and yeah i can imagine that yeah and probably a question to the both of you when you when you're feeling like that and you just yeah like say so you, you know you're not quite fitting in you're trying to find some sort of way out of it what yeah what, what, what would you what would you recommend to other people in that situation like say you, you said try to be a bit more confident all those things um 
Is it just to get through it however you can? Um, that's a, that's a hard question actually because, I mean, I guess for me what I used to do was I I try and talk to my friends from Malaysia a lot. Yeah. I think talking to people probably be the best thing because you don't want to feel like you're really really alone or you don't really have anyone to 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 relate to. So I guess like I used to talk to my friend in Malaysia quite a lot and also yeah. um some of my badminton friends in in uh in Australia. Um I guess that's what helped me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so I'd just say confiding in other people. Yeah. Sorry, Kev. Yeah, I'd say just try and reach out to as many people as you can really get a, a feel of the different people in your circle and choose the ones that, you know, accept you or want to reach out back to you or talk to you. Like as a kid, I know it'll be nerve wracking, but I guess you just got to try. You just, you, like you said earlier, um, Keith, with the self-consciousness, I think that just breaks down on its own as you just keep trying and <laughs> get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as I you go think through life. Like in high school, like it's a big thing because like you have like, you know like the the ones who are cool and then you have like the losers of school and whatever not yeah. and it's like quite obvious yeah and it can the be stereotype. quite it can be quite um quite intense <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah sure man i um i haven't actually had this question come up before but it's a good time to bring it up when you when we're going through this and i'll i'll give my answer to did you guys feel did you, i guess did you know that you were not or well, probably a better way to phrase it do you know you stood out because of the race? I know for me, I was very conscious at the time during school and all that. I just knew if there's a group of 20 of us, I'm yeah. the only Asian dude, yeah. I will stand out no matter yeah, what. Yeah, I definitely felt that. Yeah. That's why I think for me, I just tried to like shrink myself and try hide away. But now I, yeah, I don't really care. I just own it. It but sucks it for us. And it does. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, well, that, yeah, that's it, man. That's just maturity. Yeah, it sucks for myself and Keith because we had the the accent. So mm-hmm. my accent was not what, what it is now. It's evolved <laughs> over twenty something years. Oh man! So yeah. you'd be in a group and everyone's yelling. You know, everyone's teasing someone. Well, not teasing someone, but just yelling stuff, yeah, causing yeah. trouble. And everyone would know when I would say something because had the stupid accent. Yeah, the South yeah. African one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I I guess I can relate. Like I used to stand out for my accent, for the way I looked or dressed, and also like. Uh, yeah, but I guess after a while, I kind of just got over it slightly. Yeah. Like, I just wore whatever to school. I didn't even care about my uniform. Yeah. And uh, I guess, but until I finished high school, the accent thing didn't really go away. <laughs> so, but I guess I was just like, whatever, it's fine. And I forgot to ask, Keith, before we take a quick break, Um, your whole family, did you all move at the same time? And what was it for? Yeah, so... um. My dad actually came first yeah. to like kind of like find a house, um, help us find a school and all that stuff. <clears throat> then we came like a month after that. Yeah. And then he stayed for another month and then he went back to Malaysia to work. Okay. Yeah. So it's just, uh, I think for about maybe one or maybe actually two years was maybe just me, my brother, my sister and my mom. Um, yeah. And I guess we kind of managed while he was overseas working. yeah that's tough man yeah. and it's just the sacrifices that I guess yeah. family have to make yeah and I guess why we moved um, is because of like in Malaysia you know that opportunity thing where there's slight slight racism mm-hmm. in like your workplace or in terms of education and I think at the time like the, the politics going on with the government and stuff was really really bad and yeah. I think a lot of people were trying to like just get out of Malaysia yeah. if they could. Yeah, so I guess that was the biggest reason, more so like for my for me and my siblings. Yep. For like our education and our future yep. and stuff like that. I can that. relate with that. My dad yeah. my parents did the exact same thing. Yeah. And um yeah, why Australia? Was there any other options on the table? Um not really actually. I think we picked Australia because uh we do have some family here. Okay. So we all, uh, at first we wanted to go to Perth because my mom has some family and my dad has some family there as well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, based on the visa stuff, we, we couldn't get Perth. And that's why we went to Adelaide actually because of a, I think it was a skill visa or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Where you get a PR. So that's, that's why I, I think. And also Australia, 
not too far from Malaysia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like compared to America or UK or something like that. And also, I think Australia is probably one of those uh, Western countries which are a bit more Asianized, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Definitely, definitely yeah. the past couple of years. Yeah, for sure. I think that's probably why. Yeah, nice. So, so Keith, um, your Instagram profile says professional badminton player. Let's let's dig deep into that. Mm-hmm. So, what's a typical training week like for you? Uh, so it's actually really really busy. So, um, I train at least twice a day. Twice a day. Yeah. So Jeez. um, Oof. yeah, that that's about maybe four to five hours a day. Yeah. So I start in the morning. Yeah, so just say if I was not doing anything that day, like no uni, no coaching, nothing, I'll probably start at like 8 o'clock, finish by like 11, around around there. And then I come back, rest for a bit, and then I'll maybe go in gym, gym or running or something, like 3 or or like five. the conditioning and strength side of yeah, it. Yeah, so usually mornings like on-court training, then afternoons or evenings are more like uh, fitness stuff. Like cross-training. Yeah. Yeah, and um, on days that I have uni, like Tuesdays and Fridays, I try to minimize my my days that I actually have to go into uni. Um, I kind of start at 5.30, 5 or 5.30, I go to the gym or something, Jeez. and then I go to uni. <laughs> how, how do people have full-time jobs and keep up that training? You- yeah, it's uh, it's because especially like you say in Malaysia, you're sort of taken care of for other countries. Yeah, you get to that level, and we yeah. don't have that here. So, yeah, how do they expect people to get to that level if they're not being mm-hmm. paid accordingly? That's a good question. Um, I think most people wouldn't do it to be honest. Yeah, yeah, and um, there's only a very few people who are actually doing it still. Um, <clears throat> I think it it takes a lot of discipline. Is definitely one. Sure. And it's it you have to be uh motivated by something other than money i would i would say like for me it's just like i want to i want to win yeah yeah it's not so much maybe not so much the money it's like maybe i want to prove something to myself and also like i've been doing it for a long time so i'd feel like if i didn't try and achieve something it would have been a waste mm-hmm. yeah so yeah, i think so that's true. what 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 keeps me going yeah well i mean you look at even kev so we obviously had kev on the on this podcast before and He's in ridiculous shape if you check out his Instagram. <laughs> like, where does that discipline come from for you guys? So, you go first, Keith. Yeah, similar to Keith. So, it's not the money or anything like that. It's just... Chicks. Um, pa- <laughs> <laughs> it's just the passion, yeah, yeah. love for the sport, just the confidence it's given me, it's the lifestyle it's sort of set me up with, the friends, everything. It's just, everything's great, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the coaching and the money, then whatever you earn from it, outside of that or whatever you want to make out of it or turn into a, uh, your hobby into a side income is sort of a separate benefit yep. and not everyone has to do that like some people burn out doing that so it's not for everyone but you know if you've got the drive it's also fun to do because when I do my coaching or my teaching or privates it doesn't feel like work for me yeah at all oh, that's great yeah it's just what I love to do I was doing it for free actually for a little while during COVID so give you a little bit of background yeah so it's like an escape too. It's something different, you know. You still get your main job, main income, and then you got this other thing that you do. Yeah, like, like you say, if you can turn that into a bit of a money stream, then yeah. you're, you're really winning. Yeah, yeah. And I think one more thing that that really um, gets me going is like I think the competitive nature of sports. So like, like winning and losing, it's kind of like a gamble, which is like quite exciting. I feel True. sometimes you get that exhilarating rush. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, like uh, like Kevin said as well, was like the friends you meet, like you get to travel, mm. different people do different things. Like I, I always enjoy going on uh, trips like tournaments with friends. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so you just go overseas with friends and you're going for a tournament doing something that you do like doing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll be, I'm looking forward to actually do something like that. You know, my Take a show on the road or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. We'll That's, see. Yeah, we'll well, see. Keith, I really want to drill deep into this mindset thing because I think it's very rare that we have someone who's gotten to your level, you know, mm-hmm. twice a day. Who's going to be willing to train twice a day for however many years? Um, you, t- you spoke about competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Have you seen The Last Dance, Michael Jordan? 
basketball uh, yeah, fan yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched and it. he's always talking about how he doesn't have a gambling or a winning problem. He's got a competitive problem. Mm-hmm. Where he just wants to win everything. I kind of have that too mm-hmm. in certain ways. And you know, we don't need to talk about my history. Like, where, where did that come from? From a young age, it's just you wanted to win everything? Mm, yeah, I guess... Um in Malaysia, when you when you do play sports, you're like considered cool. Yep. Yeah. So that, I guess that's why I did it. Um, but also, like, once I started maybe losing a bit, then I just didn't want to lose anymore. Yeah. And that's yeah. So basically, I wanted to win all the time. And uh, yeah, for some reason, like no matter how many times I lost, I don't think I lost any motivation. It just like I always managed to psych myself back up and say like, okay, I'm gonna train harder. I'm gonna win the yeah, next awesome. one. And the you next one, you. the next one, yeah. Use the losses to fill you. Yeah, I think it still happens until today. Like, even if I lose, I'll say, okay, it's fine. Like, I'll Just get one it. or two things I could have changed and I'll yeah. get them next time. Yeah, I'll get it next time. Yeah, yeah. great mindset to have. Because there's really three reasons why people play sports. One, which I have absolutely no idea why people would do it. They play for fun. Yeah. Nothing, <laughs> nothing is worth playing for fun. The other is yeah. because they don't want to lose. Yeah. So then, you know, you're more tentative. The yeah. mindset's a bit different. And then I guess guys like us where we play because we want to beat other people. Yeah. That's pretty much. <laughs> and, and it's honestly, it's a good lesson because like you guys said, both of you, it's it's not about trying to make money from things that you enjoy. It's it's honestly just about something that you're doing for yourselves. Yep. And yeah, you, love, you want to fan that, fly, that flame, the competitive flame and all that. Um, pretty good lesson for people because I think a lot of, a lot of guys coming up, guys or girls, they want they want to do it for the money, they want to do it for the fame and things like that. Whatever it is, whether it's work, mm-hmm. you know, they want to be a doctor for those two reasons. Yep. Um, at the end of the day, you got to be true to yourself and why yeah. you are you actually doing something? Why are you? Because so, life is so short. Yeah. Like you said, you only have an amount of time. You want to be good at something. Yep. I think maybe if you're if you didn't like have that focus of like you wanting to do it for yourself. Like how long you'd actually last is, yeah. It's another question. Like how long can you keep going? Like, because oh, yeah. yeah, you might Maybe lose motivation pick. over time. It needs to be something that, that's like uh, sustainable. Yeah, sustainable that can keep you going for years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same as like you with working out. There's a lot of guys who hit the gym for a year or two and hit a plateau, and that's cool for me. And then they just blow out. Whereas you know you've kept it up for however many years now, and it's. 10 years now yeah and it's just now part of the life <laughs> yeah it's yeah. just learning I guess it's also being true to yourself and being aware that you do you do have a peak like physically and I don't think too much about when it is but I'm aware that it'll come eventually and then I gotta accept that the decline is happening and adjust my training style and whatever I have to or certain tricks so I don't actually injure myself and put me out permanently yeah that would be devastating but yeah because all yeah. the injuries I've had the last two years <laughs> it's kind of giving me a wake up call. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Keith, then what's what's life like for you now? So, um, like you said, a lot of your friends are usually from sport. Mm-hmm. Um, what do what do you? I guess what are your hobbies outside of badminton? Do you have time for anything outside of badminton? To be honest, no, not really. <laughs> yeah. So my my whole week my whole week is basically just training, coaching, and uni that's it like every day like i occasionally like have some time to maybe like watch some movies or stuff like that i guess that's my only form of entertainment or watching some youtube stuff like that's about it because i guess in order to to do uni train and coach at the same time you just have to like be really really disciplined it. Yeah. and stick to time like, management so key yeah. Yeah, stick to a schedule because as soon as one thing goes out of place, then it kind of messes up my whole week. And what's your diet yeah. like? You eat pretty well. Uh, I mean, I'm not not super strict with my diet, so I still do eat McDonald's and stuff, but not too often. And um, yeah, I try and eat as healthy as possible. And like for me, I think because I burn a lot, I just eat like like a lot. And you're <laughs> yeah. still relatively young too. Yeah, to I guess yeah, that's a, that that's something that helps too. <laughs> So tell us a bit more about um, your dating then. How do you make time at Mm -hmm. the moment? Because I think you said it was long distance, your current situation. Yep. So tell us a bit about how you guys met, I guess, number one. So I get we we met from Bampton. 
through a through a mutual friend. Um, what is this lucky lady's name, by the uh, way? <laughs> her name is Sylvia. Okay, I just yeah. don't want to keep calling her, you know, yeah. your yeah. girl. <laughs> so, so Sylvia, yeah. Yeah, so we met through a mutual friend uh, in Malaysia, and then um, we just met that one time. Then a couple of years later, we met up again at another event somewhere, and then we just <clears throat> started hanging out and dating. Um, so when we did start dating, we were both in Malaysia in the same place. Yeah. And I guess like the whole of Malaysia was in lockdown for like a year. So I guess we were just hanging out every day because there was nothing to do. No training, no uni. Were you allowed to actually hang out one-on-one in that, during that lockdown phase? Because in Australia, yeah. it was the rules were always fluctuating. Like you can have one household member, one outside household member. Yeah, and then it was like four. It was such a back and forward thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Was it, it, was, like it was actually really strict, but I think just got away with it <laughs> yeah nice. yes under the radar yeah um so yeah i guess we, we we didn't have any like literally nothing to do in malaysia because i only started studying this year actually okay yeah so before this i was just doing badminton full time so when i was in malaysia like no training nothing so i was just like literally chilling every day sounds Net- pretty bloody good sounds like a lot of netflix and chill yeah <laughs> 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 yeah and then she went back to Germany to continue studying once uh, COVID was over yeah. and I guess at the moment how we manage is just call a lot video call a lot and uh, the time difference doesn't make it easy but so when I wake up she's kind of going to sleep yeah when you got like a small little two hour window every day yeah so there's that small window for both of us and um, I mean occasionally like maybe on a Saturday or Friday night I might sleep a bit later yeah, so I guess that's how we make it work and maybe try and see each other whenever we can. She must be a special special woman to do the long distance. Um, yeah. Have you, I guess, how do you, how do you contrast it to, uh, to I don't know, a normal relationship that when you're face to face? Um, yeah, I think long distance probably not for everyone. Yep. Yeah, because I guess, I'll build on that. Um. Have you, like, what struggles do you find with it? Like, because I'll tell you about mine. I've done long mm-hmm. distance before as well. But I think the number one thing for me was you have to trust each other, like, 100%, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Being long distance, you're not going to be able to keep up with them. Yeah. Or check in every single hour or anything like that. You just got to trust and... Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, I guess, like, definitely the biggest challenges would definitely be, like, trust, which... I don't think we really struggle with. <laughs> that's good, man. Yeah, so I think that's that's something that, that makes it easy for both of us because, yeah, if you don't have that, then that's going to lead to, like, a lot of arguments and stuff. And I guess another thing is, like, being understanding. Like, because for me especially, like, with my schedule, mm. uni, training, coaching, like, there are some times where I don't really get to talk to her much. Yeah. Or when I do get a chance, I'm, like, dead tired. Yeah, so I guess that understanding part is is really important and maybe one thing that also keeps it going is like having like a goal at the end of it. Like, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be long distance forever, I guess. Oh, true. Yeah, so you have like a date set in the future that you guys will I mean, not again. like a specific set date, but I mean something where like at least you have something to look forward to. to and like it's not like it doesn't look hopeless like the whole time, you know? Yeah, yeah. So did you guys always have like a, a holiday planned or the next time you're going to meet, you know, whether it's yeah. a year from now, six months, whatever it was, did you guys always have that? Yeah, so I guess, I guess we try and uh, and set like a specific time period where we are going to meet again or something like that. So like I met her, actually I went to Europe to play some tournaments and I also met up with her when I did go for the tournaments in Europe oh, nice. yeah. uh, end of last year. And then she came to Australia in April. So she was here for about, for about two months. Oh, that's oh, nice. yeah, of time. In the past one year, we've been apart for maybe like seven months, but then the other few months were like together. So try and see each other as much as possible. And I guess the badminton does help when I do travel for tournaments. Yeah. If it's nearby, then I don't mind stopping by in Germany or something like that. Yeah. Nice. You, you touched on the trust and the understanding. So I don't know if you said it on camera or not, but she was a, well, she is a very good badminton player. So she understands the mm-hmm. training, the lifestyle and all those things that, that mm-hmm. come with it. 
Yep, 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 yep. So that definitely helps because um, I guess she's lived a similar lifestyle. Yep. So should should be more understanding of like me being tired or me having to wake up early or sleep early, and um, so well, even just the ups and downs of yeah of sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's her sport background like? Or badminton? Did she play for many years? Before? Yeah, so she started like quite young, similar to me as well. Yeah. And uh, I guess hers was a bit different because when she was 13 years old, she went into like the sports school in Malaysia. So it's like a boarding school. Sport. Yeah. So where she was the, pretty elite from a young age. Yeah, where all the national athletes wow. have to live and train. So I guess for her, it's probably a bit worse growing up yeah yeah, yeah. from 13 jeez yeah. have to get her on didn't yeah. even know when I <laughs> and, <laughs> and they just friend like, of the show yeah some crazy crazy stuff in, in training yeah can't imagine I can't even imagine that's like yeah. another level so Kev you you spoke a little bit about your long distance was there any is there anything you want to add so you know Keith's spoken about um, you know, the understanding the communication for, for someone who's looking to do a long distance to make it work is there anything that you found either did work or didn't? Um, I'll say it's not for everyone. And even I wasn't open to it originally and neither was she. It was kind of like, there's something special here. Let's at least give, give it, it a, a go. Yeah, yeah. I always kind of believe, you know, mm-hmm. try and not have to ask yourself what if. Because um, I think I was, you know, if I had my earlier self back in high school, I would have just chickened out and left it. But I was like, oh, something's good here. Let's just give it a go. And I guess advice would be you have to have, like, that trust. If you're insecure or jealous type, it's not going to work. It's just going to be fights, like Keith said. Mm-hmm. So if you are if you know you're like that, like, really look into yourself. Just don't even bother. Don't even pursue it. You yeah. waste the time. And I think the other key thing was you have to have a date in the future where you're going to meet mm-hmm. something to look forward to. Yeah, and the light plan in the tunnel like Keith spoke about. Yeah, exactly. And a plan to actually be together, I guess, forever at, or meet up at some point. And yeah. Yeah, because long distance, I don't know. I don't think humans are set up to do that. Yeah. I certainly know I wouldn't be able to, um, yeah. which is probably more reflection on me than anything. But <laughs> um, A lot of communication too, like you said, Keith, yeah. with the video chatting even little check-ins every day, just a selfie of whatever you're doing, yeah. I think helps just Actually, whenever you've got a spare moment. Yeah, just little you, things about updates throughout your day. You definitely have to work a lot harder in a, in a long distance in, in terms of communication and yeah. putting in that extra effort when you don't really want to like use your phone and stuff like that. But yeah. Like even you mentioned how I know I relate to that, like the whole training and studying and you have just a lot of time, even just a quick, you got a spare five minutes, just a quick selfie, whatever you're doing, you know, mm-hmm. at the training. Yeah. You know, I'm sure she wouldn't mind seeing you all sweaty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then probably the one of the last two things on dating, Keith, do you, do you usually find you're attracted to, um, I guess, people of similar race, culture or anything, or hasn't really factored in? Um, hasn't really factored in, but I guess um, it does help in the sense that um, like at least you have a similar understanding or like similar similar values yep. like your upbringing because if you're from like similar culture or or, or backgrounds then you, you definitely have like similar values which make it easier for you to get along or is say, she religious at all or what's yeah her? so she also is uh, Catholic and yeah. she's Actually, like, similar to me because her dad's Indian, her mom's Chinese as well. Oh, wow. So You guys have a lot in common, yeah, so I can see why it's <laughs> yeah. why it's, why it's working out, out nicely. Yeah. yeah, so I guess it does definitely help in terms of uh, of making a relationship work, but I haven't really thought about it much. It's just, like, I guess it just happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then, sorry, my, my very last point on it is, so then you come to Australia when you're 14. Mm-hmm. Do you... Do you like Australian women, girls at that time or do yeah, you always in the back yeah. of your mind think I really want to have someone of a similar, you know, race, culture, religion, no, etc.? I, I never, never thought of it that way, but I guess it was just like whoever. I mean, I guess when you're 14, it's just like whoever looks good. <laughs> take whatever you can take whatever you can get at that point. <laughs> yeah, you're not, even, you're not even thinking of like if they're a good person or anything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like whatever, yeah. And then, and then getting a bit older, like say, it hasn't really factored in. Uh, I wouldn't really say the race thing. I would say it doesn't really matter to me that much as long as 
the other person is willing to accept your your background or your values and they don't like force you to change to change or like do stuff that you're not comfortable doing then it, then it's fine yeah have you ever been forced to do anything uncomfortable <laughs> 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 save that for later <laughs> um, and then like we, i guess now we're talking about your life here keith have you have you felt any you know indirect or direct racism um in your older age oh, yeah. in australia i'm talking about yeah yeah de- definitely um I guess not nothing major nothing huge but I think maybe like just small things here and there like maybe you know like it's a common thing when you go to a restaurant and then someone starts talking to you really really slowly <laughs> yeah yeah but then you understand everything they're saying even even if they're talking at a normal speed like maybe it's like the un- unconscious forms of racism <laughs> yeah or Yeah, I think at times maybe if you go in a public place and like for example if you go to a restaurant and they see an Asian they might be a bit rude to you sometimes. Yeah. I guess that's quite a common thing for me as well. Um I've definitely felt that. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I've also had the opposite where I go to a Chinese restaurant and they speak to me in Chinese and I'm like Yeah, yeah. I don't understand a single word and I just that's feel like, worthless. <laughs> <laughs> I try to immediately say something in English so they understand that yeah. they need to switch. Yeah. Yeah, but that's fine. I've that's you know, that's on me. I probably should have yeah, learned another language. <laughs> yeah. But I guess maybe other than that not nothing really crazy, nothing crazy, but just uh yeah, maybe the occasional instances of people being a bit ignorant about, you know, your culture and whatever not where like you you still feel out of place sometimes even though you're in, you've been in Australia for a long time yeah you still like feel that sense that some people still view you as just another asian like yeah yeah i will say that i think it's very small now i think in general mm-hmm. especially in australia it's very multicultural there's a lot more yeah, acceptance yeah. and definitely yeah, so i don't experience it very much at all whether yeah. it's in work social life dating etc yeah, yeah. There's just oh, small things that we probably remember and I think it's just shaped us into who we are today. It's yeah. made us stronger. Yeah, I think not so much uh when you're older, but it was a really big thing in school, I feel. Mm. In high school it was like yeah, really yeah, same for obvious. Me. Yeah. But af- after that was fine and I guess because of badminton is predominantly Asian. Yeah, so <laughs> your your typical like friends group now, do you hang out with like a mix or is it mainly um mm-hmm. I guess non non-white people? Um to be honest like in Brisbane I actually only have like maybe two three friends. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so and those uh those friends are my training partners. Um cuz I don't think in Brisbane I've actually had the chance to to socialize. Oh well, man, you got no time for yeah, what so, we're hearing. It's yeah. it's, it's it's a sacrifice to to get to this level and that's yeah, that's so, the the price. Yeah, majority of my friends are actually from like overseas or from a lot of them from Melbourne. Yep. Because like a lot of Bampton players in Melbourne as well. Um but in Brisbane not really many friends. So I mean I have one friend she's uh Taiwanese. Yep. And the other one's like a guy he's uh he's Australian. Okay. Yeah, and I guess that pretty much makes up my friend group in Brisbane here. Yeah. But um well who knows maybe this podcast, you know, someone will hit you up. <laughs> What is it? T- Tinder groups or whatever it is. Yeah. What? <laughs> Where you like make friends with groups rather than individuals? Oh yeah. yeah. Obviously, I'm not on Tinder, but. What? Um, and then is that man, a thing. <laughs> yeah, apparently that's a new thing. Yeah. I've been told. Oh, it's not Tinder group sex. No. no. <laughs> yeah, something else. Oh, could be. <laughs> uh, maybe those was for a bit. Yeah. And then I guess, full circle, Keith. So mm-hmm. you know, I'm looking at you now. I'm seeing a you know very driven guy. Mm-hmm. successful guy to get to that level you know whatever whatever sport whether it's bloody darts or something mm-hmm. it's a lot of hard work and sacrifice along the way is there anything along your journey so i'm talking probably more sport than personal mm-hmm. that um you can sort of pinpoint to and say you know that was that was really important for me i maybe had a pathway whether it was you know i could have chose between soccer or, or badminton is there anything on that side where you think you you would give yourself different advice uh, when you were younger um yeah so i guess 
couple of instances. I would say like maybe the biggest thing where I would kind of wish I could change was like maybe taking the opportunities when they are presented to you. Like don't really don't hold back or don't be scared to go for it because you never know like if you're going to get that same chance again, whether it be like at a tournament or maybe talking to someone to get a sponsor or just like even just even like at a random badminton court you see like a good player when you're younger just walk up to him and say like hey do you want to play a game yeah i feel like that's something that i wish i did different because it would have opened up a lot more doors for me a lot more opportunities maybe i mean i'll never know but i think it could have made a bit a big difference and uh another thing would probably be like uh yeah take the losses and like really really learn from them because every single loss is actually really important more important than the wins how i feel yeah. yeah yeah i agree with that i think all the losses and failures is how you learn yeah if you're never so, losing or, or if you're never failing you're not really pushing past your comfort zone i feel yeah for me so i embrace them yeah i agree so that's really really important i think a lot of people are not willing to to lose because it's a terrible feeling but they're afraid of mm-hmm. losing or afraid of failure yeah and that's something that i had to overcome which was like when you play a game for example like you play like you play to win rather than playing to not lose like it's a big big difference in that sense yeah and then Mindset. yeah that's that's good man and then my my last one and this kid's got something else culturally mm-hmm. are you, do you want to do you think it's important to hang on to your you know your malaysian roots um you know your indian side all those things is that something that's important to you to i don't want to talk too far with kids and things like that but mm-hmm. for yourself do you think it's important to hang on to that or do you think you're in australia now let me just do as the australians do um I think for myself it's really important like I feel like that kind of makes me who I am and if I were to like try and you know just drop everything and try and be like full Australian then I wouldn't be myself anymore. Yeah. Yeah so I think like no matter what I'll probably keep it in a special place like forever because like that's that's who I am and also but I still feel maybe it is important to also learn a bit more about like Australian culture like you know stuff they do stuff they don't do cuz you know you have to like get along with society as well and i guess that you can learn something good from every culture as well like yep. you know chinese indians malaysians whatever or even australians there's always something good that you can that you can learn from from each culture yeah, I, like i guess that. Take if you, the best parts yeah if you put it all together then you know you get the best yep. combination yeah and there's there's no sort of you know good percentage or waiting there's no right answer on how to do it it's just mm-hmm. like you say it's what makes you different it's what makes you yourself yeah through different experiences yeah. and cultures yeah i think yeah most important is just like being yourself like if if you gravitate more to like being more australian or doing more australian stuff like you know culture wise then like if it makes you happy then just go for it you yeah. know like maybe some people they prefer like uh keeping the asian culture like as their predominant thing where they focus on but i guess some people they're happier doing the other stuff like like for me it's a mix <laughs> and it's the hardest mix to try and get right i think because yeah. like you said there's always different the different sides pulling each other yeah. and it's yeah. never going to be perfect so. yeah that's right so keith we've just got um one last thing here we're going to do a quick rapid fire mm-hmm. so eight questions um kevin's going to ask you basically you just pick whichever one comes to your mind it's just so the the listeners can get a bit of bit of better idea of who you are. Yep. Okay. So, um fire away. All right. Uh so Keith, texting or calling? Depends on the person. <laughs> uh all right, we'll go with Sylvia. Uh calling. Calling. Uh summer or winter? Summer. Uh favorite city? Probably Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah. Okay. Uh Japanese or Korean food? Japanese. <laughs> Friends or How I met your mother. Oh, how I met your mother. How I met your mother. Uh sunrise or sunset? Sunset. Reality shows or documentaries? Do documentaries. 
Okay, and the last one. Would you rather pause time or rewind time? Rewind time. <laughs> and can you give us a bit of insight into why? Is there anything you'd want to rewind? No, I mean, I want to rewind because, like, I feel maybe you could make some changes, I guess. You know, make some improvements here and there. Yeah, that's fair. And then um, the very last one is what's next for you? Uh, next for me, I guess, uh, complete this semester of uni. Um, I'm actually preparing for some tournaments in October. So about a month away. It's quite soon, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, three international tournaments. Where, where, where are they? Are they local? <clears throat> yeah, so one in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, and then the other one in New Zealand. Right. So it's like the Oceania tour. And then uh, after that, I'll probably go to South Africa, actually. In, uh, have you been before? No. <laughs> so, You'll have yeah. a great time? Yeah, I hope so. So in November, because I'm actually trying to qualify for the 2024 Olympics. Yeah, I was going to say that's got to be on wow. the radar. Awesome. Um, yeah. what's, the, what's the process to get there? Um, so the Olympic qualifying period starts in April next year. And it's basically open for a year where you collect points right. and get your world ranking up. So only if your <clears throat> if your ranking's high enough, then you qualify for the Olympics. So you have to basically play like a load of tournaments. And do, are there only certain tournaments where you can get points? Like yeah, just grading? the BWF international tournaments. <clears throat> but the thing why I'm starting to play a lot now is because in order for you to actually get in tournaments, you have to have a world ranking which is high enough already to get into the bigger tournaments. So the bigger tournament you play, the big the more points you get. Yep. Yeah, so you basically have to start now before the actual qualifying period starts so you're in a good position when it does start. Yeah. If, you, if you don't mind me asking, where, where are you currently ranked in Australia? Uh, I would say... Like do you have an official ranking? Or? Yeah, there's, I would say it's a bit difficult to say because like in, um, in February, I won the Australian national ranking. Oh, right. So, so that, you're, you're either the best or very close. Yeah, so that technic- technically put me at one. <laughs> yes well, but then yeah. after that in uh in april yeah in april i lost the national championship um which is a game maybe i shouldn't have lost <laughs> but yep. yeah so it kind of me- messes up the ranking slightly oh, okay but I, I would say like top three yeah. yeah top three top two yeah. and then like you said the top three doesn't automatically get into the olympics you have to then go that second round if you're ranking. yeah so the lucky thing about that is like you you basically have to qualify yourself yeah, so it doesn't matter like if you're number one, number two, or number three in Australia. It's just like, even if you're number five, but internationally you do the best out of the f- the five, yep. then you get to go. Jeez, man. Yeah. That's, <laughs> like you say, there's all the money and the time spent and you might still not yeah, yeah. get there, but yeah. Well, man, hopefully we uh, keep in touch, but also hopefully we see you yeah. um, <laughs> on the big in screen. Paris. Yeah, yeah, hope so. We'll say we, we know that's we know this guy, friend of the show. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, man, no, I appreciate the time and there's really a lot of good insights in there. So that's great. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me.